Yeah, sure. Oh, Ready, you right? Okay, yeah. yeah. All right, let me start again then. <clears throat> so with me today on the Mechanical Care Forum, I'm pleased to welcome to the podcast, Dr. Tim Hewitt. Dr. Hewitt, thanks for taking time out of your schedule and for joining the podcast. Thanks for having me, Jason. It's my pleasure to see you today. We're, uh, we're excited to, to have your interest and your, your, um, your uh, agreeing uh, to, to talk about this topic, this focus topic, uh, some hot topics in our field of conservative care, uh, musculoskeletal conditions. Uh, for those that are listening, uh, the non-contact injury, both mechanism, treatment, prevention, all those things. We know that you're an expert on that. So again, uh, happy to have you. Before we get into the, all those topics, uh, can you just give the listeners a, a touch of an understanding of uh, your background, what it is that you do and where you are? So I am a basic scientist. On my training, I have a PhD in biophysics and physiology. And I actually came out of the field of cardiovascular biophysics, biomechanics. I studied conditions like FHC, familial hypertrophic cardiomyopathy at Cincinnati Children's Hospital for my postdoctoral fellowships, and basically looked at the connection between myosin isoform content in human hearts. We would look at those mutations that caused FHC, introduced them in various animal models, and then study the biomechanics and biophysics of the heart after these mutations occurred in vivo. That got me interested in the connection between neuromotor control, genetics, sports, injury. And from there, I branched out and, and did some studies with Cincinnati Sports Medicine, where we started looking at problems in female athletes. We did a study early on where we showed that they were 6.2 times more likely to have a non-contact ACL injury than male athletes. And that put me on a trek to figure out why. And I've now been studying non-contact injuries for about 30 years. All right. Very good. Yeah. I've learned so, a lot in the last three decades. Yeah. Well, I want to hear about that kind of evolution of, um, uh, of, of both the sports metric program, the, you know, identifying the mechanism and how do we, um, uh, what, 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 um, what type of mechanisms are, are modifiable? How can we change that if in fact we can? Um, but what were you guys seeing early on, maybe in the literature review, even before you began trying to put a, a program together to reduce that higher incidence levels in female athletes, what was out there at the time? And then what, what was that initial phase one or, or generation one of, of sports metrics or a prevent, ACL prevention program look like? And so at first we, we didn't really know those, those early studies. It was actually quite controversial when we first published that that women were in the range of four to six times more likely to have a non-contact ACL injury in the first place. It's when you start finding sex differences, it's, it's not the most politically correct thing to publish. I actually had a challenging time to publish it. And this, this is, like I said, three decades ago. And obviously because of that, we wanted to move forward and answer questions like, why is this so? The first thing I wanted to say is what we realized was that because the nature of these differences in, in risk were in non-contact injuries, that gave us an opportunity because, because it's a non-contact injury, that means it has to be related to the internal function of the body, to neuromuscular control, muscular contraction patterns. So that's what we started looking at. And we published kind of a seminal paper in the American Journal of Sports Medicine, one of the first to look at this issue in 1996, where we basically showed dominance patterns were different in, in males and females. So basically, we characterized in that paper and many others that followed it for dominance patterns that we found not only in just female athletes compared to male athletes, so this was the case, but also it turned out 
athletes that were at high risk of a non-contact injury showed these same imbalances regardless of whether they were male or female. So the first imbalance we showed is what we called ligament dominance. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is instead of using the musculature to absorb and dissipate force from the ground to the knee joint, allowing that force to go to the ligament and allowing the ligament to control and dissipate force. Well, muscles, especially sagittal plane muscles, calf flexors, extensors, knee flexor, extensor, hip flexor, extensor, trunk, those are designed, especially in the sagittal plane, to control and dissipate force. Whereas ligaments, you put too much force on a ligament and, and it, it's going to rupture. So that's what we term a, a ligament dominant individual. And we can talk in, in more uh, detail about what is that is characterized by in athletes. The second, the second imbalance is related though. It's different. And that's quadriceps dominance athletes who are going to go on to a subsequent ACL injury, whether they're male or female, tend to be quadriceps dominant. They tend to be very front loaded. And what I mean by that is in order to absorb and dissipate force at the knee, when they do activate their musculature, they primarily activate the quadriceps. Now, the quadriceps is a, is a very powerful muscle at the front of your thigh, and it, it is good at absorbing and dissipating force. There are problems, though, in being quadriceps dominant and not posterior chain dominant, which is the opposite of that pattern, in that when the knee, when you're landing, so if this is my knee joint, tibia, this is my fibula, femur, and you contract your quadriceps, what you're doing is extending the knee, and because of the geometry of the knee, so the, the medial well, I'm sorry, this would be the lateral, this is my figure, the lateral tibial plateau is convex as is the lateral femoral condyle. Whereas on the medial side, the medial tibial plateau is actually concave and the convex medial femoral condyle fits into it well. But when you, when you, the knee is near full extension and your quadriceps dominant, you can track the quadriceps primarily to stabilize the knee. It does bring the joint together it does stiffen the joint, but because of the geometry of the knee, what it causes is this combination of rotation, especially internal rotation, and that, that because you have this convex to concave interaction on the medial side, that's the pivot point. Well, what happens is not only does the tibia rotate in, it actually distally goes out and comes forward. Well, that's a problem because that stresses the anterior cruciate ligament. It puts strain on the anterior cruciate ligament. So quadriceps dominance is a pattern that increases risk of high strain and ACL rupture. The third dominance pattern that we observed in, in women compared to men and in athletes who were relatively high risk of injury was what we called leg dominance. Now, all athletes are leg dominant, but what you see in those athletes who are going to go on to an injury is they have different dominance patterns and, and a lot of difference in force dissipation, strength, neuromotor activation on one leg versus the other. They favor one leg over the other. And what you see is, for example, asymmetry side to side in quadriceps peak torque, but more importantly in hamstrings peak torque side to side. And you see big differences in relative hamstring to quadriceps activation side to side, big leg dominance patterns in that. So leg dominant individuals tend to be at greater risk of non-contact ACL injury. And the final neuromuscular imbalance that we found and reported on was what we call trunk dominance. You know, the way you observe that in athletes or an athlete who's at relatively high risk is the trunk during landing and cutting movements, the trunk moves a lot around relative to the plantar surface of the foot where the foot is planted. So if I'm planted on my left foot, 
the trunk tends to move over that left hip and knee. So you get a lot of frontal plane trunk motion, but especially to the side of the planted foot. What that leads to is high ground reaction forces that come lateral to the center of the knee and hip joint and cave those joints inward, which leads to this valgus mechanism. So let's talk about the valgus mechanism. Well, the mechanism of these injuries, the valgus mechanism is the primary mechanism of injury. And if we have our knee joint here again, what you see is when an athlete is injuring themselves, let's, let's talk about the overall body habitus. I just, I just pointed that out. What you see is a trunk lean over to the side where the injury is going to occur on the planted foot, where most of the force and weight in. The knee starts out mainly straight. It's relatively uh, extended. The, the trunk comes over. The knee and hip go into this collapsed valgus motion. The foot is flat on the ground, which means a high ground reaction force. And the, the, the center of mass of the trunk is going is moving lateral to the, the mid knee and hip. So that's what you see overall in the body when you see these injuries occurring. But if you focus down and on the knee, what you see is, again, this being the lateral side, this being the fibula, what you see is as that flat foot with a high ground reaction force is, is hitting the ground, you see the distal tibia moving away. You see uh, away from the uh, midline of the body. You see that the, the knee and the hip caving inwards. And what you see is um, these, these high loads that lead to this combination of torques. This, this distal tibia moving away causes a valgus torque at the knee or what's called a, an external knee extension abduction moment medially. Combined with that is anterior translation and internal rotation of the tibia relative to the femur. And when these all happen at once, the ACL ruptures at high enough load. Okay. So, so how much load does it take to rupture the ACL? Well, this is your ACL. Uh, it's, the, it, it's proportional to the size of your pinky finger, the first two digits of your pinky finger. We reported back in the early 90s that if we were just going to pull, no, this is the, the ACL actually resides in the more toward the middle of the joint, but I'm not going to use that as a, as a example. And it is proportional to the size of your pinky. And by the way, your thumb is proportional to the size of your posterior cruciate ligament, your PCL. Where they cross in the sagittal plane is the center of rotation of the hinge of the knee joint. And, and basically that center of rotation changes as the knee flexes and extends, which becomes important depending on the knee and hip flexion angles. And this, this is a very strong, very elastomeric piece of tissue. If we just pull it apart in the laboratory, what we showed is it took about 1,800 newtons of force to tear the ACL apart. Well, what that turns out to be, it's, it's about 450 pounds of force to tear the ACL apart. Now, uh, another group in New York City, uh, you know, just because even cadavers are tougher in New York City than everywhere else in the world, showed 2,200 newtons, but say on average, it's around 450 to 500 newtons of force, or, or 450 to 500 pounds of force. So it's a very strong, very elastomeric, stretchy, elastic tissue. But the ground reaction forces you're hitting during landing and cutting on a basketball court or a soccer pitch, are multiples of your body weight. So for example, if I'm 225 pounds, I'm hitting the ground. This is just during walking. This is I'm walking across the ground because of 
my body mass and the momentum of that mass, I'm hitting the ground and the ground is hitting me back with two to three times my body mass. That's enough force without the musculature dissipating the force to tear my ACL. Now on a basketball court or a soccer pitch, you're cutting and landing with oh, easily five to 10 times your body mass. So, so multiples of what the force takes to tear your ACL if you're say a ligament dominant individual and not using your musculature to absorb and dissipate those forces. So that, that's the, the mechanism of the non-contact injury. And, and that's why, uh, for example, a ligament dominant pattern in athletes measured prospectively subsequently leads an athlete into a higher risk category for going on to an anterior cruciate ligament rupture. Mm-hmm. Interesting. You talk about the weight, say a, a 225 pound male that's walking, you're saying because it's on single leg to single leg, there's enough force, but isn't that a compressive load, not a shearing load that would then put that whole amount on the ACL or any kind of ligament? Well, there, there's a combination of load. I'm just saying at the joint, you have enough load there to rupture an ACL, mm-hmm. but If you have that combination and it all goes into compression, and it's been shown just with simple compression because of the geometry of that joint, you get those coupled shears of that valgus anterior translation internal rotation. That's been demonstrated in both cadaveric models and in in, in, uh, silico or computer models. That, that that there would be enough force there in the absence of any muscle activation to dissipate those forces. I see. Okay, sure. So those are the that's the mechanism, the, the actual action on the, the knee per se. Uh, are there differences in from individual to another individual that would make one more susceptible, more vulnerable for that than than another? Yes. So we always, there, there's, you know, as sports scientists, as sports medicine professionals, we always want to predict, right? Well, I'd say we can predict as about, a, about as well as a, as a meteorologist can predict weather. You, you can have an idea of what the weather is going to be like, but you certainly don't know in a certain spot for a certain individual, what the weather is gonna be like in the future. On the flip side, just as in meteorology, you can stratify relative risk of certain types of weathers, conditions, injuries. So that's, that's what we're trying to do. We're not trying to predict a specific injury in a specific individual that's going to happen in the future. What we're trying to do is risk stratify. And I, I have a paper in, I published a few years ago in JOSPT, which outlines that very clearly, that it's not prediction per se, it's really risk stratification. Yes. So are there categories of individuals that move and activate their musculature in ways that give them and put them at higher risk. Yes, you can risk stratify individuals in that way. And of course, you're outlining the non-contact injuries uh, because those are the things that perhaps may be more modifiable than something that's out of your control where someone is struck from the lateral side and creates that same mechanism, uh, I'm sure. But the same forces will produce a contact injury as well to the ACL. Well, they're somewhat different, but yes. For for example, if you have a a direct blow, so this is what happens very often in football amongst linemen. So a lineman or a you know they're so say the the center is is planted, the feet are planted, and the guard next to him or Uh, a defensive lineman push directly lateral into the knee and create that valgus torque. What that is, is because it's, it's coming externally and it's directly on the lateral surface of the knee, pushing the knee directly. And that's a, 
that's a direct medial torque. Uh, what normally happens is the MCL ruptures in that situation. That's why you see in college football linemen and professional football linemen, they wear those, well, they call them ACL braces, but they're really uh, to prevent MCL sprains, the, those direct blows to the MCL. And they're, they're okay at doing that. That's actually been demonstrated in the literature that those braces will decrease the risk of an ACL and interior alignment, but it's a, it's a different mechanism. You don't get that, that really high force directly hitting on the lateral side of the knee, pushing that knee into direct, almost uniplanar frontal plane valgus is more likely to rupture the MCL or, or uh, sprain it. Sure. So long ago, you guys were seeing these observations and these mechanisms that make up kind of that perfect storm, so to speak. Um, what was the thought? What, how did it start in terms of the implementation of some program to reduce the, the likelihood of, of an ACL tear or a, you know, connective tissue type of non-contact injury? And how has that changed over time? So, so what we saw early on with these combination of imbalances. So basically, here's the idea. Anything that you can do that's going to keep the knee out of these, this combination of positions, the knee and hip collapsing inward, the tibia coming anteriorly and internally rotating. Anything that you're going to do to reduce the risk of that is going to reduce the risk of that injury. You reduce the mechanism. Well, the way you get at that is directly related to that mechanism are these neuromuscular imbalances that we discussed. So what we did is designed programs based on those neuromuscular imbalances that were directly related to the ACL non-contact injury mechanism. So what we came about was I came out of a powerlifting background and a lot of what you do with high intensity plyometrics is you're trying to create muscle dominance you're trying to create especially if you do the 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 plyometrics properly you're loading the posterior chain especially if you're sitting back and things like squat jumps so you want to turn on the posterior chain and make an athlete more posterior chain dominant rather than quad dominant. You're going to do a lot of single leg plyometric hop to hold, hop, hop, hop exercises, hop up, down exercises, where you're going to try to create leg to leg symmetry, symmetry, not only front to back between posterior and anterior chain in the lower extremity, but side to side symmetry on, on strength, power, control balance measures, and also plyometrics and, and multiple hops and hops and holds are great for creating core control, especially with the center mass over the, the foot base with the hip and the knee in a stable neutral configuration. So we, we started with plyometrics, we also did strength training as well, uh, especially posterior chain strength training, a lot of balance type of exercise, but very dynamic balance exercises that we're going to translate onto the field and onto the core and then core control exercises that that could start maybe, you know, on a, on a ball or another kind of, you know, uh, feet off the ground exercise, but then bring them onto the feet into dynamic situations of core control. And I would say, you know, everyone says, what is, what is one thing you would do if you could do anything? And I would say single leg plyometric exercises, sitting back, activating not only the core, but the posterior chain with the the core the center mass of the body over the plantar surface of the foot with the hip and knee flexed and in a 
stable, neutral frontal plane configuration. If you can do that repeatedly and then teach an athlete to do that under stress, under perturbation, you can reduce the risk of a non-contact injury in that athlete. So to what degree should um, people that are observing or assessing these athletes, should they look at the foot or is there any importance in looking at the foot and ankle? Absolutely. There's important in looking at the foot and ankle because that's where the force is coming from. And the, the torques created around the knee joint are created by that ground reaction force that is directed to the, toward the umbilicus, the body center mass. And where that foot, well, first of all, how that foot lands. Because a non-contact ACL injury always, and I will tell you this, I, I will challenge you or any of your listeners to, to show me or send me a link to a video where that foot doesn't land flat on the ground during an ACL injury, the foot lands flat. If you can teach that athlete to always roll the foot, use the foot as a rocker, the ground reaction force goes down significantly. Just telling an athlete to land more softly can drop the ground reaction force by 50% or more. So that's a starting point rolling the foot, not landing with a flat foot, using that foot as a rocker to dissipate force. That's, that's actually a crucial part of it. And there are multiple ways to do that. One is just your ears. So for example, my, my office where I used to write the grants to fund all this work sat right off of our training area. And we had a specialized giving surface and we would bring entire teams of kids in and train them all at once. So you bring in 35 adolescent girls and you put them out on the surface and you're in there writing a grant and trying to focus. It sounds like, let's not even talk about the chatter, their feet landing from doing repeated squat jumps. It sounds like cattle literally hitting the floor. It's just pounding. Then you have a, you know, 225 pound bald man come out on the floor and say, kids, we got to, we got to quiet this down. I'm in here working. If I don't get this grant, we're not going to be able to fund these studies and your training. And all of a sudden, the, it literally immediately, everything quiets down. Now, what are they doing? They're rolling their foot more, unconsciously rolling their foot more and flexing their hip and knee more and absorbing those forces and not landing with a flat foot. So yes, the, the foot is what creates that ground reaction force. So yes, it's absolutely critical to teach rolling the foot and not landing flat footed. When you say rolling the foot, are you talking from the heel to the front or so vice versa? He, Either way, usually what it depends. So if you're if you're landing off a vertical jump, you want to go four foot to midfoot rocker. Whereas uh -huh. if you're coming forward during a cut, you want to go, you know, midfoot to four foot rocker. You want to again stay off any situation. You don't want heels down. So you want to, you want to rock in from mid to four foot. Mm -hmm. And from a frontal plane motion, what are you looking for? Is, or is that important? It, it is important. You're just looking for a stable, neutral position, not a lot of side to side roll. You, you want, because again, the problem when you get a lot of frontal plane motion, the major drivers in the lower extremity are not on either side of your legs that they're and they're not designed to absorb and dissipate this and a lot of motion you just want to stabilize that and keep that in neutral position hips over knees over the balls of the feet with a with stabilized relatively small amounts of of ankle knee and hip roll and then you want to use sagittal plane flexion and, and uh, from the foot, sagittal plane rocking motion to dissipate force. Because again, that's the primary movers of the lower extremity. That's how they're most efficiently designed to absorb and dissipate force from the floor. Mm -hmm. What do we know about 
training and teaching and coaching athletes in a voluntary way to land a certain way, to push off a certain way, to cut a certain way? And does that translate into involuntary changes from a perspective of on the court or on the field play situation where they've adopted that without thinking about it in a consistent way? Does that happen? Yes, I think it does. And here, here's why, because Again, these studies that we did all through the 90s, we did the exact same neuromotor training programs. We showed that it lessened these imbalances that we saw in the laboratory. And then we took the exact same thing and we went out with oh, 1,300 plus individuals on the field, trained them, showed the changes in the laboratory and then showed very well correlated changes in injury outcomes. So yes, it does translate out onto the field or on the court. It would have to, or you wouldn't see those decreases in, well, you wouldn't see the changes in the laboratory pre and post training. And then you wouldn't see the, the decrease in injuries that we saw. Mm -hmm. So yes, it does translate onto the field and onto the court. Mm -hmm. So my uh, understanding, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, the, the program that, that, you're, that you and, and your colleagues developed includes stretching and strengthening like lunges and squats, uh, quadricep stretching, uh, Achilles or calf stretching. It also includes some jogging forward, jogging backward, some shuffling to the side. Um, it includes uh, some double leg hopping and landing techniques, some single leg hopping and going through that in a forward and backward direction from a side to side direction. Um, and it includes some box type of drop jumping. Uh, what am I forgetting? And, and yeah, first of all, is that, is that a, a, a real brief and uh, accurate summary? It's a reasonable assessment. Early on when we designed it, we had stretching in there. Later iterations, most of the data shows that slow static stretching doesn't reduce the risk of a non-contact ACL injury. So if we're going to do uh, static stretching, we do that after the bout of training and or after practice or on alternating days because that's uh, slow static stretching is not gonna reduce your risk of an ACL injury. The other things you described, yes, that's what we do. But I, I would say again, uh, with a lot of focus on progressing out to active single leg uh, landings and takeoffs uh, in chaotic environments introduced. So perturbation involved as well is what the program later involved into when, when we went off on our own and did it. Yeah. Can you talk about those higher level activities? What do they look like when you say perturbation? Is that an actual coach that's tapping the shoulders of the athlete or is it a ball that, that's being that's, thrown? That, so that is a, when they're balancing on a, say an air X mat or a, a BOSU, that's a, that's a coach, uh, tapping them at the hip, tapping them at the shoulder. What you see very often in these non-contacts or in these non-contact ACL injuries is there's often a perturbation. The, uh, often the perturbation that moves the center mass lateral to the involved knee and hip comes from another athlete or comes from the athlete's change in attention, moving them, catching a ball. And, and so, yes, all of the above that you talked about. So we're going to introduce that directly from a coach, throwing them balls, doing this eyes open, eyes closed. The, the more chaotic and perturbed the situation you can in, introduce in all three planes of motion and teaching that athlete to expand their envelope of control the more likely they're going to drop their risk level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, talk to us a bit about the, uh, the studies that you did. I'm, I'm curious to understand, you know, um, 
some would say that until you have uh, an intervention uh, delivered and a comparative sham intervention uh, and shown that one is much better than the other, you can't say that the placebo is not the, the primary reason why there's any differences. Mm -hmm. uh, have you done that kind of work? And can you explain you know, what, what was done and, and what were the results? Yeah, so, so we did that study all between, we got NIH, multiple NIH grants to do that study in Boone County, Kentucky, which were, was where my farm was at the time. It's, it's where the sort of CBG, the Greater Cincinnati International Airport is in Boone County, Kentucky. They had had some unfortunate Title IX lawsuits. They had had a slew of ACL injuries, and we came in at the right time with this proposal. So yes, what we did is we tested and we trained every six to 12 year old kid, a 12th grade kid. So sixth grade, which is around 11, 12 years old through high school, through 12th grade. So through 17, 18, 19 year old kids in an entire county school system. And what we used was a cluster randomized design. It was randomized by team because basically you, you can't individually train at, you know, that volume, thousands of kids. So we did, we cluster randomized it by team. And yes, we had a sham intervention. This sham intervention was designed just to increase. It was a study we'd done early and protocol we've come come up with just to increase speed so it was just a straight ahead single plane uh, speed program basically resistive band training that sort of training so which we did would would not hypothesize would ex, would affect someone's frontal plane control these studies are published well, there's there's multiple publications in 2015, 2016, 2017 in uh, American Journal of Sports Medicine in Medicine, Science, Sports and Exercise that detail these studies that included the, the sham intervention and the test intervention. And we demonstrate clearly that those interventions targeted to these neuromuscular imbalances drop those neuromuscular imbalances in the athletes that got that training relative to the sham intervention, along with dropping injury risk. So yeah, those, those studies are, are published and, and have been done. Those were, those were long-term uh, National Institutes of Health funded studies and demonstrated just what you pointed out, that just as we hypothesized, it was especially focused at the at trunk control. Trunk neuromuscular control is where we really focused. We didn't focus down on the knees. Our hypothesis is if we could teach someone just to be a less trunk dominant athlete and have better core control, that was going to improve the other profiles, the other neuromotor imbalances. And we didn't want to bias the population. So we just did what we called TNMT, trunk neuromuscular training. And what we showed was indeed that approach decreased it, decreased trunk dominance, but it also decreased leg dominance, ligament dominance, and um, quad dominance mm -hmm. in, in those individuals with that intervention compared to the sham intervention. Mm -hmm. Tim, I'm remembering you mentioned earlier that if you could uh, anybody could find a video that shows a flat foot or that not a non-flat foot and a rupture of an ACL, uh, you'd be very interested to see it. You've never seen that. Why wouldn't your focus or why a focus on the trunk versus maybe a focus on something that without a doubt is associated with every non-contact injury, that being a, a flatter foot, the inside of the foot dropping to the, to the ground? Because there's more to it than, than just the foot. I, so, so the ground reaction force is important.
important. There's, mm-hmm. there's no doubt, but you have to have that combination. So that valgus torque at the hip and knee is what creates this. Mm-hmm. Now that happens in con in, in combination with a high ground reaction force. So let's talk about how a torque is generated. So a torque is a force of a certain magnitude, a certain level, like I was talking about, it, it takes, for example, in, in force, it takes 2000 Newtons of force to tear an ACL. But a torque has a, a force, but it is a vector. So it has also a three dimensional direction. Well, a torque is a, a force, a three dimensional vector times the distance to the joint center, okay? So this force coming from the ground and the magnitude of it is quite important, but also its position relative to the position of the joint center is what creates this, that torque. So the ground reaction force aspect is different, is, is important, and I do think it's important to teach someone to roll of the foot and not land foot flat, flat, flat footed. And we've demonstrated that and it does do that. But in combination to drop that valgus torque that's actually loading that ACL and rupturing that ACL, you also have to increase that frontal plane control, that distance from that force to the hip and knee joint center. So what you're gonna do is you got to decrease that ground reaction force, but you got to decrease this distance too to actually make a difference in how that individual is loaded, how that Mm -hmm. individual's knee and ACL is loaded. Mm -hmm. You have to have, you have to do both. I see. So once an ACL is ruptured, uh, there's lots of um, uh, comparisons. Uh, Should an athlete or should an individual, whether an athlete or not, have a reconstruction or should they not? And if so, which should they have? What can you tell us? Now that's, we've been doing in the last decade, that's where a lot of our work is focused. So where we went from there in that big county, those those studies are, uh, we just submitted another paper from that that original cohort to, a journal of athletic training. So basically what we showed was these neuromuscular imbalances put an athlete at risk of an ACL tear. And then we kept following the same athletes over time, over many years, decades, and basically followed those that went on to a second ACL tear. And then we had data from when they returned to sport. So we, we had measures of ligament dominance, trunk dominance, leg dominance, quad dominance on all these individuals when they returned back to sport. And we started looking at that. Okay, now what are the predictors of a second knee injury? And that's been a series of studies we also published in multiple journals, but primarily in the American Journal of Sports Medicine and Journal of Athletic Training. But basically... Let, let's talk about risk for a second injury. In young active athletes, your risk of a second in, of a second ACL injury is unacceptably high. If you're young, active, going back to the same sport at the same level, your risk of a second ACL injury is somewhere between 20 and 40 percent. That's that's as you can see, just unacceptably high. That's why we kept moving on with these studies because we kept seeing these athletes being injured again and again. During these studies, our study team had six researchers on it with us at Children's Hospital that had had two ACL ruptures. The first ACL rupture is very, very difficult. The second ACL rupture is devastating in every way physically, psychologically. So let's go back. Someone tears their ACL. Should they or should they not have it reconstructed? This is a controversial concept. 
I do not think, in my opinion, that someone should automatically have their anterior cruciate ligament reconstructed. So there were multiple studies out of the group that I was with originally at Cincinnati Sports Medicine that demonstrated what we termed the rule of thirds. Now, what do I mean by that? That study showed that about, about a third of people do not function well without an ACL, even when activities of daily living. That third of athletes should have their ACLs reconstructed. That, that means just with walking, you're gonna have giving ways. If, you, if you're having giving ways with walking, you should have your ACL reconstructed. Now there's a second third of individuals who can go back to activities of daily living and be fine without an ACL. They can actually function pretty well without an ACL. Now that's the, that middle third is the, is the difficult third because you don't quite know whether you need that ACL reconstructor or not because that leads into the third third, the top functioning third. About a third of individuals can go back to the same level of sport and function without an ACL. Now there's, there's a lot of discussion around whether that third should be reconstructed or not, because what, what many surgeons are gonna tell you is, okay, they can go back and function, but they're gonna end up tearing their meniscus. There, there's gonna be too much motion in that joint, too many rotations going on without that ACL. On the flip side, I was in a, a group called the ACL study group uh, that was the top ACL surgeons in the world, about 150 of the top ACL surgeons in the world. There was more than a handful of those guys that I knew had ACL ruptures or bilateral ruptures who had no ACLs and never had them reconstructed. And these were the top ACL surgeons in the world. What that tells you is it is an option, especially if you can rehab your body in a way that is going to allow you to react and dissipate that force as we've been talking about. Make yourself muscle dominant, make yourself uh, symmetric, make yourself posterior chain dominant and core dominant, where you can control that, that joint before that load hits the ACL to a high level. So about a third of people, theoretically, can go back and play very high level sports without an ACL. And it happens all there. There's, oh, there's endless numbers of, uh, from John Elway, on there, there's at least a dozen uh, players that have played at the high. We're talking Super Bowl MVP level people who played without ACLs and and functioned very very well. The other thing a, a surgeon might say is, well, if you don't get it reconstructed, you're going to have a lot of uh, micro motion and end up with osteoarthritis in that joint. Here's what the data says. Kate Webster, who's based out of Melbourne, Australia, she's a world expert in systematic review meta-analyses, has won a lot of the top world, award, uh, world awards in that area. She and I recently just published a, a meta-analysis of, of all the meta-analyses that have been done in the literature regarding, regarding osteoarthritis after ACL. And we just published this last year. Basically, what you see is the regardless. So regardless of whether you have the ACL reconstructed at about 10 years, you have about a third chance of osteoarthritis in the knee at 10 years. That's regardless. If you break it down and compare those who have had their ACLs reconstructed versus those who have not, there's actually a slightly but significantly higher risk, about a seven, eight percent higher risk of osteoarthritis in the surgically reconstructed knee than the non-reconstructed knee. 
what is the surgeon's response going to be to that? Well, that's because that athlete was more active. You know, they're going further back. Uh, the group that's done most of the work there is, is based out of Sweden. And, um, and they basically showed that even if you control for activity levels, there is a slightly higher, though significantly higher risk of osteoarthritis on a surgically reconstructed knee. So the answer should not be the reason to get an ACL is to prevent osteoarthritis. That is not the case. That's not going to do that. You could say, well, the reason to get your ACL reconstructed is to not tear your meniscus. That data is equivocal. There are plenty of studies that say there's no difference in downward subs, downstream subsequent meniscal tears and uh, reconstruction or non-reconstruction. There's been some more recent papers that say, yeah, there's a big jump in meniscal tears, especially if you're really young and active. But uh, that data is, it, it's, it, there's there's as much evidence on one side as the other and so that that's not really what we do know is long-term reconstruction doesn't prevent OA I would say surgery shouldn't be the first option it should be the last option rehab go through the rehab see how you function see how you do if you can function without repeated swelling episodes, repeating given ways, see how you do in your sport, go back. And, and I do think there, there is a cohort, that is a, that is a real option. And if you say, well, that's not an option in say the NFL or NBA, because everyone has their ACL reconstructed, that's not true. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are a lot who, what happens normally is, Here's, here's the way it goes. So a very high level player that the team really needs tears his ACL. They probably don't tell anybody, you know, they probably don't release, oh, he had an, a knee sprain because they want him to play the whole rest of the year. So he, he waits till the knee settles down, maybe a few weeks. They start playing him again. He starts playing again, John Elway, Super Bowl goes to the Super Bowl without an ACL functions. And then, you know, they tell him, well, as soon as, you know, off season hits, you're going to get your ACL reconstructed. And, you know, he and maybe his agent or his wife or whomever say, well, well, you function pretty darn well without one. That's usually how it happens. And there are, there are even a fair number of people out there who rupture their ACL and don't know it. That may be hard to believe, but they are out there and they function pretty darn well. There's a lot of people who after a pro level career in sports find out that they're ACL deficient or insufficient and we're, we're not aware of it. It is definitely an option. So let's talk about graft options. Those are options too. So currently and still the case in the world, the hamstrings graft is the most popular, most used option. And that's the case in Canada where they do almost solely uh, hamstrings reconstructions because it's a, a social uh, well healthcare system and, and that's, that's all they're pretty much allowed to do because it's the cheapest option. Uh, they're, they're used a lot in Europe, whereas here in the United States, almost no one in the NFL or NBA would get a hamstrings graft. So there's, there's a lot of controversy about how this is. So I worked for many years with a group of surgeons who covered an NFL franchise, but they also covered a lot of um, adolescent high school level female and, and collegiate sports, they would put hamstrings grafts in female athletes and never consider a hamstrings graft in, a, in an NFL or an NBA player. We'd ask, why is that? Well, the NFL or NBA player needs the gold standard. They need that 
what what at that time and a lot of people would argue still is the gold standard which is the teller tendon bone tendon bone well they we'd say well if you're gonna put that in a if, if you have to have that in an nfl player an nba player why are you going to put a hamstring graph in a say a high level collegiate olympic level soccer player well girls are smaller their muscles aren't as large they don't create as much force maybe they don't need this bigger which very often is a bigger meteor graft and it has bone on either end so when you put it in the tibia and the femur you have bone to bone interfaces on both sides and when you put an interference screw into the two you have a really solid construct whereas with the hamstring you're using an interference screw on one side and then you're using an endo button or what's basically a molly a suspensory fixation on the femur there's more give to that so I would argue this hamstrings graph in somebody who already tends to be quadriceps dominant and taking two or three tendons out of the pezantorinus complex of say five total is really going to reduce if you look at overall their relative hamstring strength and hamstring muscle activation, which it does, that's clearly shown. And it, it takes at least two years to come back in the average person, if not longer, if ever. But also say if you have a female soccer player who needs to internally rotate her tibia relative to their femur, as every soccer player has to do to dribble a ball and control the, the ball, um, taking that medial, you know, two or three out of those five hamstrings out of the tendon, that is a bad idea. They do it for cosmetic reasons because a small scar on the, on the, you know, medial side of your knee where the hamstring lies, you know, in the, in the medial posterior corner is not as observable as this worm shaped scar on the in front of your kneecap to your tibial tubercle. That's part of it. Um, anterior knee pain, uh, women and girls. Uh, we, we've done these studies. Women and, uh, and other female girls, female athletes, have about a 25% risk of patellofemoral pain if they're playing sports like volleyball and soccer and basketball. We showed that in those, in those county studies that I told you about. We saw 25% incidence. So surgeons try to stay away from you know that that anterior compartment taking that patellar uh, uh, tendon to to utilize to to reconstruct the ligament that's also part of the problem mm -hmm. now a newer although it's it's not necessarily new it's just become more popular again option is a quadriceps tendon so above your patellar tendon and quadriceps you can do that either either all soft tissue not take a bone plug off the patella or you can take if you want a bone plug on say the femoral side or the or the tibial side you can take a bone plug from the from the patella that gives an option and the latest data is that option is just as good as a hamstring option or a bone patella bone option I like that option for multiple reasons. If you have a quadriceps dominant individual, maybe taking that tendon is going to bounce things a little bit. And it's a big, strong, you can, you can get as big a graft as you need. It's not going to be little like a, a very, in very many individuals, adolescent athletes where those hamstrings can be very small. It can be as big as you want to make it. You only usually take about the central third. You can take more. Um, you can make it as large as you want. There's a lot of, of good options. The, the data is saying it's the outcomes on it are good. A lot of people will say that that's just because it hasn't been used in volume long enough. But the newest data out of Scandinavia, 
and the Norwegians are starting to change practice based on this data. They, they used to do 90 plus percent hamstrings and now they're doing more and more bone to tendon bone, more and more quadriceps as well. Mm -hmm. There's kind of a high learning curve with the, con uh, with the quadriceps because basically because you have four muscles and they're all, the, the heads of those muscles are all coming together at that quadriceps tendon, the fibers aren't all aligned. So, it, you know, a lot of surgeons don't like the feel of that when you cut it out because it's, it's not nice and linear like a, a, the fibers are of a patellar tendon or of a hamstring tendon. But more and more, it's becoming utilized and most of the data is showing that it's, its performance and outcomes are, are as good and sometimes better as as than a hamstrings or, mm -hmm. or maybe even a bone tendon bone. Mm -hmm. So those are your options. The, the other option is allograft tissue from a cadaver. Allograft tissue from a cadaver is okay if you're a 40 plus year old pickleball player or tennis player, or you just want to go out horseback riding and, and be able to, you know, put a valgus load on your knees to hold yourself to the belly of the horse. That's fine. Allograft's failure rates are multiples of what autographs. So the, the other ones we talked about taking it from yourself, autographs, the hamstrings or the quadriceps or the, the bone tendon bone, they fail. Allographs, the cadaver tissue, if you're young, physically active, going back to high level sport, they fail at multiples of the level of autographs. Those should not be used in young athletes. Although it still happens all the time, it's a bad idea. The data clearly shows their failure rates are multiples of the autographs failure rates. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hewitt, if a person has surgical reconstruction versus not, uh, or one type of reconstruction versus another, what are those criteria that are most um, uh, supported that says that, okay, this athlete is ready to go back into sport. Is it that triple jump on a single leg for distance? Is it a lateral for time? Is it a combination of things? Uh, what, what, what is it? So here's the bad news. So, so Kate Webster and I did also a, a medicine meta-analysis of meta-analysis. Some people have made fun of us on that and called it an inception analysis year, you know, it, 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 has, it is a method used by Cochrane and Cochrane have used its, its official name is an umbrella analysis. So we did a meta analysis of all the existing literature on return to sport uh, programs, uh, criteria, testing batteries, whatever you want to call them. And these are usually the ones you think about the, the four hop tests combined with something else, T tests, you know, maybe, maybe uh, uh, some like a, a Q's activity form, uh, just, you know, there are various ones out there that claim to have high validity. Um, what we showed clearly was these don't have high validity. Currently, what we're doing is not good enough. It's not valid for prediction of who is going to go on to a second ACL injury for sure. When we looked at that data, we were surprised when we had all the, all the cases together, contralateral ACL injuries combined with graft ruptures, which are smaller numbers. Uh, actually, you have more contralateral ACLs for second ACL injuries than you do at graft ruptures by, by multiples. But when you put them all together, there's no effect. Passing, well, for one thing, the one first thing we showed in that was that the, the percentage of people who pass existing test battery, batteries is unacceptably low. It's about 23%. It's too low. So that's, that's how many, only 23% actually pa ever passed the test battery. So if they're going back to sport, they're going back to sport and they haven't passed. Mm -hmm. So the pass rate is actually very low. But if you also look at, well, for example, its ability to predict return to sport, that's okay. You know, if you pass return to sport at one in two years, you're going to be like, oh, 60% are going to be back a year and 80% are going to be back at two years, depending on what level of athlete they are. Mm 
obviously the higher level, the, the pro athletes get back at a, at a higher level. But then when you look at how well does passing one of these return to sport batteries predict a second ACL injury? If you look at all the graphs together, it doesn't predict it well at all. There's no correlation, basically. It's not a significant correlation. However, if you break the graphs apart, when we looked at, we just looked at graph rupture, passing a return to sport battery reduced the risk of a, of a graft rupture, which remember is the smaller number, the fewer people tear their graft than their contralateral ACL. It reduced it by about 60% when you weeded out the grafts and the contralateral side. Here's the, here's the disturbing part. And it, it, again, these are relative risk ratios. So the, the percentages are large as the relative risk are relatively small. But if you look at the percentage change, your risk of a contralateral tear after passing return to sport battery goes up 235%. Mm. So current in current usage, our batteries for returning people back to sport, say passing and say, you're okay, you're not gonna have a second ACL tear are not good. They're not highly valid and more work needs to be done. We have to do more work on the side of really looking at these neuromuscular imbalances. So those kids that we, we looked at, because you now these are, you have to remember, these are smaller populations. So the data I'm gonna talk about is on a, about 159 kids, because we're looking at kids who've had a second ACL tear. So that, that rate is relatively low, but we actually have biomechanics and measures of neuromuscular control on it. What we used was, what we found out of thousands and thousands of biomechanical and neuromuscular measurements was four things, four imbalances that led into a tear, a second tear, a net hip internal rotation impulse, meaning that ground reaction force is internally rotating and adducting the hip. So Whereas those who are actively using their hip and glute musculature to externally rotate and abduct their hip and keep the hips and knees squared didn't have an increased risk. Those who had a net internal hip rotation moment impulse at landing off a drop vertical box jump, jump had an eight times increased risk of a second ACL tear. Hmm. That 2D valgus notion, a motion at the knee, that medial drop, those that went on to a second tear had a three and a half times greater risk of having a second ACL tear. A big difference in the amount of quad to hamstring activation and especially leg dominance symmetry in that. So individuals that on their involved side are really decreasing their quad activity, but on the other side have higher quad activity to hamstring and have a big asymmetry in that, they had a threefold higher risk of tearing the ACL the second time, having a second ACL tear. And finally, those individuals, we put them on an unstable platform and measured the amount of sway on an unstable platform. And those that had a real stiffening pattern, they don't really sense that joint very well because they've lost those mechanoreceptors in the native ACL and they don't have good kinesthesia, joint position sense, good overall proprioception around that joint. So they stiffen it, they, they decrease the degrees of freedom of motion and control. They had a, a two and a half times greater risk. If we put those four factors together, that model could predict who was going to have a second ACL injury with about 90 plus percent sensitivity and specificity, a very good model for, for risk stratifying individuals who are going to go on to a second tear. The challenge is those are based off 3D biomechanical neuromuscular measurements and unstable force platforms. So it's harder to do. But we, that's a better way to go. 
but we have to take that further to make it more clinically applicable and more generalizable to large populations. Mm -hmm. Reducing injuries by half and uh, non-contact ACLs by two thirds is pretty good. How do we get it to 90, 95%? That's, that's the challenge where we have to bring in multiple aspects of everything from how a child is introduced early on to sport to information and education. I mean, we, we have to bring uh, the whole team systems together increase education, increase awareness, make this happen from a very young age, get these, get these programs that we know decrease, again, based off of, this is also based off of meta-analyses, so meta-analyses that we published in a journal of orthopedic research, we show 50% reduction of all ACL injuries in all athletes, two thirds reduction of non-contact ACL injuries in females, we have to get those instituted early at the right time, which is right before the, the peak growth height stage, right before they really hit puberty and start spurt, you know, their, their massive growth spurt right before that happens. So it has to be done early. It has to be done at the right point. And it had, we have to make sure that we increase compliance and adherence. So the teams and the coaches are doing it. And so that the players like it, see the advantages they get from it, like greater performance, and they want to do it and they do it. Mm -hmm. Those are the challenges. And that's what's going to get us there to those higher levels of risk reduction. Mm -hmm. I had shared with you uh, a group out of New Orleans who's doing some work and you had um, I, maybe to some degree at least taken a look. I want to share with you, uh, share my screen real, real quickly and just have you comment. Of course, what I had mentioned was that they're looking at a quality of movement pattern. Well, you've seen, I don't know to what extent uh, them discuss it, but here you've got two individuals in the posturing of the leg as they either hit the ground or come off the ground. Um, they're looking at uh, whether that uh, similarly, the ankle foot and how it responds when it hits the ground, whether it goes flat, they, they call it the inside ankle bone, drops low or stays high. And yeah. then whether they corner the heel, meaning that they roll with the heel uh, uh, moving away from midline versus it staying toward midline. You can see in the two different individuals here. What are your thoughts to that? And um, is there similarity or is that a different thought process than what you guys are, are showing? I think there is a similarity there. So that, that inside ankle bone high, what, what you're doing there is basically you're keeping a, a neutral hip and spine and you're, you're not allowing hyperpronation that's going to couple uh, valgus motion. So I, I do like that. It's also enhancing by teaching that you're enhancing awareness of keeping the knee joint and hip joint neutral in the frontal plane and you're doing it by wherever you're doing it you're focusing on the inside ankle bone or foot motion but you're going for the same effect so i do i do like this idea i think it's a good idea and it mm -hmm. should work yeah and i guess their comment too is they look for this uh maybe a, a varus almost bowing of the leg mm -hmm. upon push off or propulsion forward versus this neutral to even a, a, a valgus sounds similar to what you're talking. Yes, I, I agree. I, I like this. I, I think it's going to, I think it's taking people in the right direction. Yes. Fantastic. Well founded. Um, well, very good. Well, um, yeah. Uh, tell me um, what's, what stone is yet to be turned over on this topic? What has you excited and interested? Where are you looking to study next? What I, what, what, where my focus is really figuring out how we can risk stratify people for second ACL injuries. What are the test batteries that are going to work best and reduce that risk of second ACL tear and those risk reduction strategies? So tailoring to those risk stratified individuals, tailoring 
neuromuscular training interventions that are going to drop that risk of a second tear. And that's where we've been focusing our work in the last decade. And we still have work to do as, as our, as our umbrella now, our umbrella analysis demonstrated. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. We appreciate the work that you're doing and looking into that. If you uh, wanted to direct someone who has an interest to, to look into your work more, where would you send them? Go to my YouTube channel. So it's, uh, it's Tim Hewitt. Um, just search me on YouTube and uh, I've got all of our latest work in video format there or PubMed, Timothy E. Hewitt. Uh, you can also find me on, on Twitter, uh, Hewitt1Tim, Timothy Hewitt, PhD, either of those. Instagram as well, also under Hewitt1Tim. But, but uh, if any one place, I would direct them to Tim Hewitt on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. We appreciate your time. Thanks for sharing uh, all this work you've done over the last several decades. We appreciate that. And uh, thanks for joining the podcast. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me, Jason. Okay, I'll stop it right there, my friend. Was, how was the question? You okay with you? Uh, hold on. <laughs>